let us quickly recap what we did yesterday. Yeah, so operations on sets, we saw what are binary unions. You understand the word binary? Yeah, union of two sets. Then binary intersections, binary Cartesian products. Then what were the elements of Cartesian products? They were ordered pairs. And we are going to use Kuratowski's definition for the ordered pairs. Yeah, the, this ordered pair x, y is same as this two element set from which we can extract the first element as well as the last element. Then we also define what is power set and uh, different uh, function types, yeah, injective, surjective and bijective, nothing that you do not know already and the set of functions from A to B. We will use two different notations, fun A, B and b to the power a. Now, before I start writing anything new, so uh, have you met illiterate people, those who cannot count? Yes, maybe some, uh, somebody has some relatives or home in village. So, illiterate shepherds do make sure that all their sheep comes back home in the evening. How do they do that? Even if they have, let us say, 100 sheep, how do they make sure that all the sheep is back? They map it to something and count it. Very good. They map it to what? Let's say a stone. One sheep. They okay, so they can map it to stones or sometimes they have a gate. Yeah, the farm has a gate and when the sheep are entering, <laughs> they use their fingers. Yeah, so that there is one to one correspondence between fingers and the sheep while, while they enter. So, this shows something. This shows that the idea of counting is not as fundamental as the idea of bijective correspondence. One to one correspondence is, is the key. Yeah, I mean even people who do not know numbers formally 1, 2, 3, 4, they can still use this idea of one to one correspondence to count. I mean, whatever is the actual meaning of count. Right? So, uh, this idea was uh, emphasized by one of my professors in Manchester, and he is a really great mathematics educator, Sasha Borovic. If you ever want to read up on him, or he ha also has books on mathematics education, he gives really excellent talks only based on pictures. Yeah, there is no mathematics involved, but you will learn lot of mathematics through such talks. Okay, so bijective correspondence is our key. Yeah, and we are going to use that idea today to define something. So, once again, I am going to recall something which we have already done. Uh, so, recall von Neumann ordinals. Ordinals will be a spe special topic of study later on. Right now, I just need, I mean, I can put them in brackets and just say natural numbers. Okay, where 0 is the empty set or the set consisting of nothing. Then 1 is the singleton 0 set. Right. So, it is also 0 union singleton 0. 2 is defined to be 0, 1. It has precisely 2 elements if we know what cardinality is and that is also equal to 1 union singleton 1 and take it forward. So, n is defined to be n minus 1 union singleton n minus 1. Right? Understood this type of definition? We are just adding one element at a time and what is 10? Well, 10 is all numbers from 0 to 9, all the numbers less than 10. Right? So, therefore, uh, ultimately we, we define omega to be equal to n such that n is a natural number.
So, these are the natural numbers, yeah, 0, 1, 2, up to n and so on. All right. So, omega is just our notation for this order and then you can observe that for natural numbers, m less the m and n, we have, this is a very important property, m less than n if and only if m belongs to n. So, belonging relationship has now become our strict ordering on natural numbers as well. Right? So, 0 is less than 2, so 0 belongs to 2. 1 is less than 2, so 1 belongs to 2. Correct? So, now we know this and now we can define a finite set. Using this definition of von Neumann ordinals, a set A is finite if there exists Does anybody want to complete the definition? There exists some natural number such that? Very good. So, there exists a natural number n for which there is a bijection or oh, maybe uh, this A is confusing with our English language A. So, I will write A. If there is a bijection between A and N, okay, a set is finite if it is in bijection with a natural number. Well, this is precisely the definition you were aware of, correct? <coughs> we just formalized it more uh, axiomatically. Okay, so this is the definition of finite and the set A is countable if do you want to complete this definition? If there exists a bijection between Right. If there exists an injective function from A to omega, right. So, a countable set could be finite or infinite. So, we are just saying it, it needs to be in bijection with uh, either some natural number or the collection of natural numbers, right. So, that is that is what we are writing. V what is the meaning of countably infinite? So, countably infinite, some people also call it denumerable, yeah, I am just going to put those terms here. If you read a book, then it might also be called denumerable. So, instead of injection, they will use a bijection. Okay, if there exists a bijective function from A to omega, then it is a denumerable or countably infinite set. So, now you are ready to solve that problem on pigeonhole principle from the tutorial, yeah, because you know what is a finite set. Okay. So, now uh, this is something about bijections, we will say more about bijection in the future also, like any problem about this, uh, any, any questions? Yeah, this is standard, yeah, all of you know this. Now, we will ask a natural question. So, this is our first theorem, Cantor's theorem, actually there are many results in 
set theory which are called Cantor's theorem. And the proof is also very short for a theorem. So, this is Cantor's theorem on power sets. So, there does not exist, there does not exist a bijection between a set A and its power set P of A. So, what can exist between A and power set of A? Injection. 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 Okay, so, at the bottom of the page, I am just going to write down that uh, injection. So, give me an example of an injection from A to power set of A. X maps to? Singleton X. Very good. Okay. X maps to singleton X is a bijection, uh, is, is, an, uh, is an injective function. I am not giving it a name, I can <laughs> give it a name if you want. The name would be appropriately just si singleton blank map. Right? So, we definitely know there exists an injection from A to power set of A, but we want to know whether there exists an injection which is also a bijection and Cantor claimed that there is none. Does anybody want to try and prove this statement? Any idea? Just throw ideas at me. Yeah, we have to learn how to think. Power set is bigger, but in what sense? Cardinality, fine, but we have not yet defined cardinality. That is the conclusion of this theorem, yeah, not, not really the proof. We have to use contradiction, very good. So, that is one method of proof, yeah, proof by contradiction, yes. So, if we take a, an injection, correct, correct. So, uh, the elements, I, if you take an injective function from A to P A, you are saying that after some time the elements of A will be exhausted, but the element of the power set will not be exhausted. I mean as is the case with this particular bijection, uh, injection, this particular injection. However, still that is not a proof. You have to show this for every possible injective function that it cannot be a surjection. So for a bijection, uh, uh -huh. the number of elements in set A and the power set A will have to be equal. But for the for bijection, they have to be equal. Yeah, there there should be a number of el same number of elements. Yes. And but in set A and power set A, hmm? power set A will always have uh, more elements than. That's A. precisely what he said as as well. Yeah, power set of A will always have more number of elements. But that is a consequence of this theorem. It's not a proof of the theorem yet. So there was one good idea from there. Yeah, that we had to use contradiction. So, by contradiction, what, what do we assume? That suppose there exists a bijection. So, let us do that. So, suppose f from A to P A is a bijection. Now, we are so going to use some idea similar to Russell's paradox yesterday. Okay, we are going to consider, so let yeah, this definition is the most important thing. Let B be the set of all those A's in A such that A is not in F of A.
you understand this? So, f of a is going to be an element of the power set. So, it means it is a subset of a. So, either a can belong to f of a or a cannot belong to f of a. So, we are just collecting all such elements. Yeah? Then, we are collecting some elements of a. So, then, uh, so then b is a subset of a. That you agree? b is a subset of a. So, b is a subset of a and hence b belongs to power set of a. So far so good. Now, what should we do? It belongs to the power set. So, it belongs to the co-domain of the function. A function, the function is bijective. Since f is bijective, there exists, there exists a unique element, right? There exists a unique element b in A such that f of b is equal to capital B. Every element of power set of A must belong to the image of the function, right? So, therefore, there exists a unique element B because of bijection. We could have also assumed surjection, yeah, and we would have got some B. So, such that f of B is equal to B. Now, ask the question. Does B belong to B? We cannot belong to B as A is not a, A does not belong to F of A. A doesn't belong to yes. So if B belongs to B, then B has to satisfy this property. Right? That B cannot belong to F of B. And if B doesn't belong to F of B, then by definition of capital B, it must belong to B. Same thing that we did yesterday. Yeah? And this is a contradiction which proves that there cannot exist a sur uh, surjective function. Okay? So, I will just write it down. If B belongs to B, which is equal to f of B, then by definition of A, uh, definition of capital B, B does not belong to f of B. This is a contradiction and this is the symbol I am going to use for contradiction. Two trains crashing into each other. Yeah? And if B does not belong to B, then again by definition of B, B must belong to B, f of B. Again, this is a contradiction. Therefore, there cannot exist any bijection between F and P, uh, sorry, not F and PF, between A and P A and this is the end of the proof. Yeah, very simple proof. So, uh, the, this idea of defining B is important. So, in common practice, this particular idea is called the, the technique of proof is called Cantor's diagonal argument. This technique is very frequently used in mathematics as well as in computer science. Now, uh, you can ask why diagonal? Yeah, so, it is actually not about diagonal, but it is about the anti-diagonal. 
yeah so b a and f a yeah if you plot a graph on x and y axis then a and f a looks like the diagonal so therefore we are i mean even though it's it says that a doesn't belong to f a we are referring to no points being on the diagonal so therefore it's called cantus diagonal argument any questions about this why didn't we just state it for surjection we could say state it for surjection if you want i can just change that yeah i in there doesn't exist uh, like right now i have written a bijection between a set and its power set or equivalently i can say that there doesn't exist a surjection power set of a to a oh sorry a to power set of a i should use a pointed eraser now and here i can make the change since f is surjective and instead of there exists unique i can just write there exists and prove the same result any other questions okay so let's proceed let us use some notations yeah some more notations so uh, if f from a to b is injective we use f from a arrow with a tail to b if it is surjective then we use f from a double arrow b we yeah, are two head uh, arrow b and bijective both notations simultaneously okay this is a common practice so we don't have to say anything in words yeah that's that's what notations help us for actually do you know why mathematicians invent notations yeah huh different languages. different languages yes i mean to make it language independent is one purpose but the most important thing is they are laziest people they don't want to write a lot yeah they just want to make everything concise but precise so therefore notations help them a lot okay so uh, now that we have established the importance of bijections yeah so this is uh, also like one of the philosophical themes which i want you to think about properly that uh, certain ideas in mathematics are more fundamental than their material realization uh, in mathematics like the idea of one to one correspondence is more fundamental than the concept of counting yeah the idea of relations is more fundamental yeah all of you know relations on sets yeah so relation like binary relation equivalence relations those are also more fundamental than the concept of a set even right so uh, what is an equivalence relation on a set so uh, let us be more formal yeah an equivalence relation e on a set a is i mean you said three words right reflexive symmetric, symmetric and transitive but first i have to describe e as a set so what is it e is a subset of yeah is a subset yes e subset of a cross a satisfying 
reflexivity what does reflexivity mean for all a in a the pair a comma a is in e okay what is symmetry for i mean i can write this for all a b in e b a also belongs to e and third thing transitivity actually this is not really the uh, right way of uh, writing things i should do undo and erase this properly i should say for all a and b in a if ab belongs to e then this implies that ba also belongs to e double implication is a consequence of single implication right yeah. right <laughs> we don't need to write double implication for all a b c in a if a b belongs to e and b c belongs to e then that implies that a c belongs to e now the question here is where exactly did we use the concept of a set yesterday we saw what is a class yeah so classes are either sets or proper classes we can also define an equivalence relation <coughs> on a class because we should be able to take pairs pairs of elements from a class and then we can do the same thing i am going to give you one such example yeah so any questions about this all of you know equivalence relations we will discuss equivalence relations in detail in in the next week most likely but before that let us say something more so say that sets a and b are equinumerous if there exists a bijection between them okay so equinumerous if there exists a bijection between them this is another name for having the same cardinality like yeah so uh, is this an equivalence relation so equinumerosity is an equivalence relation first we had to check reflexivity can you check that for me if i am given set a does there exist a bijection between a and a yes. what bijection identity. identity very good yeah so one sub a this is the our notation for identity a to a is a bijection okay what about symmetry some people also call it symmetry city but i feel like it's unnecessarily long so what about symmetry if there exists so if f from a to b is a bijection then then there exists yeah wh what uh, what function f inverse f inverse correct what how is f inverse defined from b to a right then f inverse 
from B to A is also a bijection. So therefore, it is symmetric, the like existence of a bijection is symmetric and transitivity. If F from A to B and G from B to C are bijections, then what is the bijection from between A and C? F of G. No, we cannot do F of G. G of F. Yeah, make sure that domains and codomains are perfectly matched. Then G composed with F is a bijection from A to C. How is G composed with F defined? If I want to send an A, then where will I send it to? First f of a, yeah, that will be an element of b and then I can apply g, okay. So, this is called composition of functions. So, what we just showed is composition of two bijections is a bijection. In the tutorial sheet, you are given a problem which says that show that composition of two injective functions is injective and composition of two surjective functions is also surjective, right. So, some special cases of this. Uh, so that together with those two exercises, you will prove this, okay. Now, uh, so what, what we have observed so far is that equinumerosity is an equivalence relation. However, we did not answer the question uh, equivalence relation on what? We just said it is an equivalence relation. So what is our collection on which this is an equivalence relation? The set of all functions. No, what are the objects? I mean, what things are equivalent? The class of all sets. The class of all sets. The proper class of all sets. Yeah, even better. So, this is an equivalence relation on the proper class of all sets. So, once again, yeah, the philosophical idea of an equivalence relation, like which groups things together and partitions. This idea of partition is more fundamental than the notion of a set. It can be done with a set or a proper class. Yeah, so, this is an equivalence relation on the proper class. So, I hope all of you know that equivalence relation partitions a set. Yeah, similarly, this equivalence relation will also partition this proper class. And those are called like equi cardinality classes, right. So, this uh, Equinumerosity is a proper class, uh, is an equivalence relation. I will write here on the proper class of sets. All sets. Okay. If A and B are equinumerous, we write A equal to B. So, if A is finite, what do we mean? That A is equivalent to A is equinumerous with some natural number, right? So, if A is finite, and A is in bijection with N for some N in omega, we say that the cardinality of A is N and right cardinality of A is N. Yes, nothing surprising here, but we took a very long time to arrive at this particular notation that size of A is equal to N. We are trying to be very careful and formal. Understood this part? If our set 
happens to be countable then we do not say its cardinality is n ok. There is there are some different rules with infinite sets. We have to uh, use some different notations those are called Aleph notations for infinite sets. So, right now we would not do that, but equinumerosity is also the same as having the same cardinality ok. Bijection means having the same cardinality. And yes, so now that that is that that is what my first point was in the first lecture. What is a number? You are thinking of n as a number that is why asking this question, correct? A is equivalent to uh, equinumerous with n, then n is not a number, a natural number like a number is not different from a set, a natural number is a set. Yeah, it is that particular set. Yeah, there is no other notion of number. So, actually, it is also okay to call this bijective class, bijective equivalence class, or equinumerosity class of a set to be its cardinality, but then the classes will become proper classes, such equinumerosity classes will become proper classes. For example, yeah, I mean, let us uh, take some uh, take a moment to understand the size of all singletons. How many singletons are there? Infinitely many, yes, infinite is, but let us be more specific. Yeah, we are learning the language of sets and classes and proper classes. So, how many singletons are there? Are there set many singletons or proper class many singletons? Proper class many, but justify your answer. Why there are proper class many singletons? Okay, let me write this. So, how many singletons are there? How many is a vague question, yeah? How many singletons exist? So, for each set A, this is a singleton. So, therefore, there are at least as many singletons as there are sets. So, therefore, the answer is yeah, I mean you feed it back to a proper class many. So, therefore, if we say that equinumerosity classes, equinumerosity class of a set is its cardinality, yeah, that is actually too big we do not want to deal with proper classes. So, therefore, eventually when we will study ordinals and cardinals, we will have to figure out another way of dealing with this problem. Yeah, so, that is why beyond finite sets right now, I am not using the word cardinality. For finite sets, we have defined what is cardinality, but for infinite sets, we have not. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, good. So, uh, I think there are a couple of things which you will need for your uh, for solving the tutorial sheet which we will discuss tomorrow. So, if f is a function uh, a prime is a subset of a and b prime is a subset of b then what is f of a prime? What is f of a prime? Tell me. Come on, all of you know this. For every x belonging to a, a prime, a prime 
the, I mean that is f of a. Yeah, so I am just going to write f of a, the collection of all f of a is such that a belongs to a prime, very good. So this is uh, not this, undo. Yeah, so this is called the direct image of f. So this is direct image of a prime under f. Okay. Similarly, we can also define what is f inverse of b prime. What is it? f inverse of b prime? All such a such that a belongs to a and f of f of a belongs to b prime very good so this is called the inverse image of b prime under f no i mean in the first one yes here but not here because when we are defining f inverse of b prime then we are not using a prime at all <coughs> yeah these are two independent statements correct the direct image of a prime and inverse image of b prime these are two independent statements yeah pictorially what is happening yeah we have uh, two different sets a and b we are choosing some a prime and then we are looking at its image yeah maybe the function is not surjective so this is f of a prime and maybe we'll have some b prime over here and we are looking at its inverse image uh, sorry yeah this particular thing maps to this particular thing yeah this is f inverse of b prime now even though these things are very simple you know direct image and inverse image their interaction their interplay with our basic operations intersection union and cartesian products yeah that's a really crucial thing to understand properly right so that's what your tomorrow's exercise sheet is all about that you, you should understand direct images and inverse images with, with respect to all these three operations union intersection and cartesian <coughs> product it is very important yeah i mean even when you are teaching a very advanced proof in some subject at that time also you are using this simple things and if you make a mistake there your entire proof is wrong these things are look very simple but they are very crucial also okay so please pay attention to tomorrow's example sheet very carefully okay there is one more thing we have we still have got few minutes left there is one more thing which i should do and that is the concept of this so let a be a set then say that x belongs to union of a yeah this is a big union union of a if there exists a y in a such that x belongs to y so let me give you an example so for example uh, let b be the thing consisting of 0 and 1 and 2 yeah these are sets 0 1 and 2 are sets so what will be the union of b 
This is perhaps a notation that you haven't seen before. 0, 1, 2, yeah. So, there is some philosophy behind this notation that there is no distinction between elements and sets, correct. So, therefore, when you start with a set, a set is itself a family of sets. So, the elements of this set are themselves sets, so you can take union of all of them. So, there is a particular axiom in ZF set theory, zermelo frankel axiom, which says, uh, which is called the axiom of union. So, it allows you to take unions of such things. Yeah, so this uh, definition is possible because of, so the definition of union of A comes from the union axiom of ZF set theory. So, this is uh, <coughs> crucial again for understanding purposes that there is no distinction between sets and elements. In uh, like in schools, we are used to say the saying this, yeah, the class of or the set of all students in this class. But you cannot really take the union of of the set of all students in the class, can you? Because the students themselves are not sets in a precise mathematical sense. <coughs> However, in Zermelo Frankel set theory, that is not the case. Every element is itself a set. So, when you write, even if there are infinitely many elements, you can still take their union. Yeah, the definition is clear. X belongs to the union if and only if it belongs to one of the elements. And that definition does not really require anything different. Okay, so any questions about anything we covered today? The union of omega will be Union of omega, yes. Union of omega will be omega. What will be union of a natural number? I will just go to that particular slide. Uh -huh. Is it this? No. No. Uh, yeah. Okay, so what is union of 2? Union of 2 will be? No, it will be 0 union 1. Oh yeah, so it's 2. No, 0 union 1. 0 is the empty set and 1 is the singleton empty set. So, 0 union 1 will be 1. Union of 3 will be? 0 union 1 union 2 will be 2. Yeah, so union of n is n minus 1. Yeah, so the union operation actually decreases the set. Union of 0 will be 0. Yeah, union of 1 will also be 0. Yeah, and those who are interested in knowing something more, yeah, so uh, that is also interesting that why should we stop this definition at this point? Just for n is equal to n minus 1 union singleton n minus 1, you can continue. Then you can also define omega plus 1. Omega plus 1 will be omega union singleton omega. Omega plus 2 will be omega plus 1 union singleton omega plus 1 and this process never stops actually. Yeah. So, that is how you get all of the von Neumann ordinals yeah, and there will be a proper class of von Neumann ordinals and we will select some of them and we will call them cardinal numbers and if that cardinal number means a particular ordinal is in bijection, it is equinumerous with your set, then this particular cardinal number will be called its cardinality. Understood? Yeah, so, there is still some uh, way to go be before we can define cardinality. <coughs>